When I was a medical student in my fourth year, I did an, an elective in a hospital in Nazareth in the north of Israel. It's an Arab town and very beautiful place to go to. And every now and again, this was back in 1993, every now and again, I go back. The hospital has a regular fundraising bike ride and that's right up my street because I love biking. And one day we're on one of these bike rides and we're bouncing down the dry, dusty hills in the Palestinian West Bank. And out in the middle of the desert, we came across this abandoned Israeli army tank just in the, in the center of the desert. Now, when you're mountain biking, one of the things that you realize is that if you see opportunities, you take them. You're there to explore. You're there to find out what's going on. You're there to understand your world. And you come across something like this, well, what you've got to do is you've got to conquer it. You've got to get on top of that with the bike. You've got to get up there. Because one of the important things is you must enjoy the view while you're going through. And I'm sitting there, standing there up there. This is social isolation in real terms. But you're in the desert, on a tank, on a bike, between Jerusalem and Jericho, and somewhere in the middle of all that, it felt like there's a metaphor struggling to get out, maybe even a parable. Tanks, you see, are big, hefty items. We're going to leave aside all the concerns that we may have, for example, about the symbolism of tanks, the militarism in general, and certainly the history in that quite troubled part of the world. But when you're driving a tank, you're under command from a central authority. You only have vision out of a very small window, so your field of vision is restricted. Everything that you come across is a threat. Everyone is an enemy. You drive over obstacles. You crush things. You move towards your strategic objective. Tanks are also very, they're big, they're hungry, they're expensive. And again, they send out this message, this very negative message of power, command, and control. It's very different when you're on a bike. You're small, you're vulnerable. There is perhaps much less that you can do, but you have a much wider field of vision. You can see things that you can't see in a tank. You can feel things, you can hear things, you can smell things. You're in touch with your environment. You're on the ground. You can learn a lot more about where you are on a bike than you can in a tank. You're also very nimble, and you can be as fast as you like or as fast as you can get. Yes, you have threats, but you learn to see these, you learn to negotiate these, and you learn to work, to work your way around them. A very different approach, and uh, I have to say I've never driven a tank. I did once have an Austin Montego car back in the day, and that was Another thing that brings me back with, uh, with some, some glee, but uh, the bike is definitely, I find, the best way of getting around. So I want to introduce you now to an amazing guy. This is Joe Barr. Joe is 61 years of age. This year, 2020, Joe broke his own world record of cycling from Malin Head, which is the northernmost tip of the island of Ireland down to Mizzenhead, which is the southernmost tip, and back again, 738 miles, non-stop in just over 44 hours. An incredible feat of ultra-endurance, world record. And it's the sort of thing that makes you think, how does he do that? How can anybody do that? It's, an, it's unreal. Joe uh, trains a lot, and Joe has got excellent nutrition, and Joe knows that I've got this slide up today, and I hope he's watching. You better be, Joe. Joe taught me three things. One, it can be done. Two, you can do it. And three, when you're at your lowest ebb, when you feel that you're ready to pack it all in and you can't go any further, keep the bike moving forward. It's all about the mindset, it's the psychology, it's about where you take things to the next level. The, the, the job, the main thing that I do, my, my day job, uh, when I'm not on the bike, is as a consultant in genetic medicine. Genetic medicine is a field of medicine where we deal with children and adults with very rare disorders. And 
it's, a, it's an interesting field in a lot of ways because a rare disorder is surprisingly common. Rare disorders are defined as being less than one per 2,000 people. So you might think that they're, they're rare. We don't get them taught a lot in medical schools. However, there are thousands of rare disorders. So the fact that there are so many of them means that although common things are common, rare things are probably even more common. A House of Lords report a few years ago said that one person in 17 has a rare disorder in the UK. In Northern Ireland, we have a population of 2 million people. That's over 100,000 people with a rare disorder in Northern Ireland. Most of those patients are actually children. So this is affecting their lives in a big way. And some of these conditions can be extremely debilitating for the patients themselves and for their families. And then that is a knock-on effect on society. How do we solve those rare problems? There's no one-size-fits-all that will do that. Back in 2003, the first draft of the, or the Human Genome Sequence was published out of the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project, that's a tank project, okay? It cost two billion US dollars, took 13 years, and thousands of researchers and scientists and technicians from right across the world to come up with the sequence for the human genome. Three billion letters of DNA. And for a patient with a rare disorder, we're typically looking for only one letter out of that three billion that's causing that problem. It's a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack that is the size of the Eiffel Tower. And that gives you some concept of how major this problem can actually be, and how do we get around uh, sorting that out for these individual patients. So that's what we try to do within clinical genetics, and it can be incredibly powerful. But at the same time, that's a tank project, sequencing genomes. How do we deliver, deliver that to individual people? And that's where the bikes come in. Nowadays, so it's 2020 now, we've moved on from the Human Genome Project. We've also done another big project that you heard about before called the 100,000 Genomes Problem Project. And we've been able to get that price point for sequencing a human genome down to just a few hundred US dollars. And that makes it applicable to individual patients where they are. Ben bounced into my clinic um, a few years ago at the age of three. Lovely wee fella bright blue eyes, and a really infectious laugh. However, he had problems, and that was why he was coming to see me. He had developmental delay, which was quite significant, and he'd recently started having epileptic seizures. When I saw him, I was able to find that he had a few unusual physical features, and I was concerned about him. His parents were even more concerned. What were we going to do? Well, we couldn't do this a few years ago, but we sequenced Ben's entire genome, and we found one letter in the middle of that three billion, that was out of place. It was in a gene called GATA D2B. I was able to show Ben's parents pictures of other children from around the world who had only very recently been found to have changes in this GATA D2B gene. They were able to see the similarities immediately. After the clinic, they went home, they went on Facebook, they found other families with GATA D2B. They then ended up going over to the US to a big meetup of other patients with the same condition. This was truly life-changing for them because this wasn't something that we had done. This wasn't something that I had done in the clinic. This was something that they did themselves. This is true democratization of the genome. They were able, through a diagnosis, not only to find an answer to their personal question in relation to Ben. But in that worldwide community of other patients with the same condition, Ben and his parents were able to find a new family. And this is the bike approach as opposed to the tank approach. We can roll in with our tanks, we can roll in with our big projects and we blow things out of the way and we're going to get this done and we're going to achieve this and we're going to achieve that. But at the end of the day, it comes down to individual people. And that's what we found whenever we did this. Ben is not the only one. I mentioned that one person in 17 has a rare disorder. We have all our science, we have our technology and our data. And our, and our data. We're looking for that one letter and that one change that's going to make the difference between knowing what's going on and not knowing. What benefit does a diagnosis bring? A lot of these conditions, including Ben's condition, not treatable. We can't do anything about it if we take the tank approach. But families find their own way. 
people, individuals, find their own way. And that's why the bike approach is the best way very often to do this. Now, when we're on a bike, and I mentioned this before, you're vulnerable, there are problems. You will be facing setbacks, you'll have to retrace your route, sometimes you'll fall off the bike into a ditch. But you are agile and you are nimble. And sometimes the tanks, as they roll through, can leave bike lanes in their wake. They'll flatten down the vegetation, they'll crush the rocks, and you can follow after these things on your bike and get to places that you wouldn't normally go. And then, once you're there, you can go to places that the tanks can't go. And this is what we found out by sequencing genomes and by doing this through the 100,000 genomes. So what if we did that? What if we take our tanks and beat our tanks into plowshares? That might be something that's worth doing. And what if, like Joe Barr, we remember those three things? First of all, it can be done. And secondly, we can do it. And third, when we're having trouble, when we're finding that this is too much for us and we feel that we can't go on, keep the bike moving forward. Thank you.